Another thing that I think he's remembered for and what I uh, picked up was uh, what I appreciated and tried to emulate a little bit was his ability to scout and also tutor uh, young drivers. You know, you were always outspoken about uh, talent when you thought you saw it uh, in some of the younger drivers in, this, in, in, uh, in the Xfinity or the Truck Series and uh, often complimenting uh, some of the younger drivers from those series more so than other more so than you know anyone else in the cup series and you were a tutor for a lot of guys you know you you're a mentor for guys like myself Matt Kenseth um you talk about you know wanting Jamie over to over at Roush I mean you know you were the first guy to really get everybody to to pay more attention to Logano and and uh there's just the list goes on and on about you know when Mark Martin would say that guy can do it, and everybody's like, "All right, that, Mark, that, he must he must can do it," because Mark Mark would know what he's looking at. Um, you really enjoyed uh, being a mentor, though, being a tutor, or uh, you know, seeing some of these younger guys learn from some of the information you give them. Like you, uh, Dale, I'm a huge fan of the sport, and um, I'm you know I really enjoyed trying to help and promote young talent. It was exciting to see him come up. The deal with Matt Kenseth is I didn't know him. I'd never met him. I knew who he was because I knew he was winning races in Wisconsin. And I knew what it took. And I also knew he was winning races in multiple cars, not just the car, one car, not just for Jerry Gunderman or whatever, but this car, that car, that car. That told me he knew how to set up cars. He knew cars. He didn't have a great crew chief that was doing everything. And he was just a great wheel man. He was cut from the same kind of fabric that I was. I knew this because I read it in the papers that, it, you know, this guy, Matt Kinsons was winning all these races in different cars up there. So when I met him at Talladega at the driver's meeting, that was it. I went straight to Jack and pulled him out of the trailer at Talladega. I said, you got to hire this guy. I know you don't have any place for him, but you have to hire him now because if you don't, he'll get away. And I like to, you know, my claim to fame on that deal is Matt brought Jack his first cup championship. Mm, yeah. So something I wasn't able to deliver for him. So I'm proud of that. It's just I just liked Matt. Matt was so much like me. You know, he was a humble guy. I knew he knew cars. And he just was, he said the right things. And, and I knew it was, you know, I just knew it was right. Um, I saw Joey Logano at 11 years old. He was a little boy driving a legend car, racing in the pro series against all men, grown men and winning. And I knew right then he was going to be a cup champion. I mean, I knew it. And I, I beat his drum as hard as I could. Um, you know, all three, I had press conferences and stuff for, you know, everything I could do, I remember that. uh, try, try to get him hooked with, with, uh, Jack Roush and, uh, they blew it. Jeff Smith and Jack treated, treated him with disrespect and eventually blew that deal. Uh, and they went and saw Joe Gibbs and Joe treated them, you know, with respect and the, the, that's history. But I knew Joey was going to be a cup champion when he was 11 years old. I really Mark, want to ask about that. Mark, Mark, <laughs> Mark, Mark calls it like he's easy. Yes, he does. Uh, you know, that I've always wanted to ask you a question. If, if I didn't know if I would have the nerve to do it, because I don't know if it's awkward or not, but I'm going to do it, Mark. You don't have to answer, I guess. Uh, 2008, you were at DEI when Dale Jr. had left for Hendrick, and you were at DEI because of the merger with Ginn, racing is that right I mean, i've got that right yeah. okay yes um I, I always remember like it was it was s such a kind of a slippery time for us being that for the obvious reasons we're leaving the family-owned company right and i remember dale jr is as tactful and as as appropriate as he could be like it still would get portrayed in the media uh his his uh you know relationship with Teresa would be precarious we'll call it that right Okay, see, your face is starting to answer my question already. Is it 
you were sort of, I remember that time as you sort of being stuck in the middle of it because you came to DEI and I believe you were driving the eight car. Were you not? Well, what happened was there was a merger. Right. And, and, and the old one car was awesome. I mean, we hauled the mail in that car and Ryan Pemberton was the crew chief. And so the merger, it was still going to be the old one car. It was going to be at DEI and Ryan Pemberton was going to be the crew chief. Well, over, you know, like in January, Ryan leaves. And when he leaves, I'm like, oh, dang, I don't, uh, that changes everything. You know, can I drive the eight car? And they let me, you know, they let me, they let, let me go over and drive the eight car with Tony Gibson and them. And uh, that, 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 that pissed uh, Regan off because Regan was slated for that. And, and I understand, but my seniority and my success, you know, I, I, I had a bigger hammer, I guess. And I, so I was, I got the eight car because of Tony Gibson and all that. That's why I wanted the eight. I didn't initially wasn't interested in the eight. I was interested in staying with the team I was with. Right. So yes, I was kind of shoved in the middle of that. Um, and you know, there was a lot of controversy, controversy over the number. And, you know, yeah, I had to say it's a practice. The number stays with the owner. I, I, I don't know. You know, I understand that Dale Jr.'s number is eight. I understand that. But it's Teresa's number. And if she don't want him to have it, how are you going to take it away from her? It's NASCAR history. That's how it goes in the history books. Sure. She would have, she would have had to be okay. So, yeah, I didn't ever feel like Junior – was ill at me. No, no, uh, no, 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 no. You know, but, but I was a little caught in the middle of it. Um, it was uncomfortable, you know, awkward. Well, yeah, yeah, me, Mark, and, me and you were put in those situations. Right? That That's how yeah. I remember it. But what I was always curious, and this was ultimately what I wanted to ask is what, you know, when he left DEI, that was sort of the end of any, you know, you know, insider information or, you know, feelings going on with inside that, those walls. I was always curious, what was the conversation? I remember you had Max Siegel, uh, you know, kind of in uh, in an ownership, not an ownership, but in, in a managerial place. He's kind of running the company. Um, you had some other Siegel people that were there. But what was the general feeling like after Dale had left and has now gone to Hendrick Motorsports? You are in morale. What, what, like, I, I imagine it was complicated. It wasn't as complicated as, as you think. Now, help me with this because I'm having a senior moment. It was Max Siegel, and was there a story? It was his last name, Story? John, John Story. John, John story. story. Yep. So th those were the two people that, that I dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis, and they were fantastic, absolutely fantastic yep. to work with. I never talked to I, – I, I ran the whole season or, or drove the whole year. Uh, Eric and I shared the car. And I, I, talk, I talked to Teresa two times the whole season. So Teresa wasn't there, wasn't, didn't have a presence there. Uh, she came to the Charlotte race one time. She was at that, out at that race. We saw her there, and I think I talked to her once on the phone, and that was it. Everything, all, 100% of my dealings were, were with uh, Story and Max Siegel, and they were incredible and the morale seemed to be really good. You know, Tony, Stu uh, Tony, Gibson. Tony Gibson. Oh, Tony is so fantastic. And he was so positive and, and the team was excited to have me drive their car. The guys, you know, they were really excited to have me. And it was a energy field, really charged up atmosphere. And that car hauled the mail i mean it was ridiculous how fast it was so pitiful we didn't win a race we i run half throttle at phoenix we should have won phoenix we had i was so far gone and had them beat and we we're like 10 laps short uh according to tony gibson and i'm telling tony i can make it i've saved you so much gas it's pitiful i never <laughs> went past half throttle i can lead it and and he pitted me because he wanted to make the owner's championship he was, you know, he was worried about making the owner's championship yeah. and I wanted to win the race. And I'm positive that I had enough fuel to make it. 
and we couldn't do it. And then, you know, we were so fast set on, I don't know, a whole, whole bunch of poles or front rows. And I was at the, uh, the second time, uh, the first time was Charlotte in May. Uh, Rick Hendrick called me and he's asking me all these goofy questions about, well, how many, you know, what's it, what's this army thing, you know, sponsorship. <laughs> not telling about the army. Well, how many races you running in that eight car? Not to, you know, like, I'm not, you know, <laughs> friends. I'm not, we're acquaintances. I'm not buddies with Rick. Henry. <laughs> Finally, I said, what is it, Rick? What are you asking? He's asking all these questions. What? He said, well, I just put you in that five car. Wow. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, I'll drive that car for 24 race schedule, yeah. but I ain't running full time. So that was the end of that conversation. The next time we had hauled at Pocono, I think something incredible led to race and all that stuff had a bad pit stop or something and didn't win the race. And my phone ring, I'm at DEI for the competition meeting or whatever, hanging out and my phone rings and it's Rick Hendrick again. <laughs> want me to drive a car. And I'm like, I stepped down the hall and I'm talking to Rick and I'm like, Rick, I, I'll run it for 24 races next year, but I won't drive full time. And then the third time I could see the handwriting on the wall with the, uh, you know, it's, this isn't going to continue. My super deal I have is not going to be able to go forward. That was two years that I got to drive winning caliber race cars and teams and got to run 24 races and, and, uh, Regan or Eric would, would, could drive the other races and uh i could see that was going to dry up for me and so the third time rick calls i just think i I just like to win one more time just i you know i didn't give one flip anymore about a championship i did not care i was the happiest man on earth i'd been miserable for 10 years in the six car the last 10 years because I was worried about points and trying to win a championship and frustrated. Finally, I was just racing for wins and for the joy of racing and working with a great team. And I didn't want to run full time, but I got to thinking daydreaming about what it'd be like to win one more time. And so I was in a good negotiating spot because it's the third time he called. So I made him a deal that I'd run full-time one year if he'd give me the 24 races the next two years. And, uh, well, he, he jumped right on it. And so that's how, that's how 09. Uh, came and then about. he, then he figured out how to talk you into running full-time <laughs> the rest well, again, of the rest I, of the contract. I just assumed it was because like, all right, I'll run full-time if you could let me run that one race at Vegas for junior motorsports and get them their first win. I, is that not how the conversation went? <laughs> that's funny uh, you know the picture that flashes in my head was is yeah but uh keselowski got taken out now i wasn't oh, i didn't right. draw the first blood on that carl drew the first blood that wound up taking that's keselowski right. out but yeah. brad was really pissed about that he was mad and i didn't i don't feel like i hit him i got hit <laughs> you know I, I got hit and turned into him yeah this is uh, a lot but, about you. We're here talking about the win, and you you're still you hung up on the on what happened to Brad. You won well, that. Well, you brought you brought up the race, and yeah, anyway, yeah, I got them their first win. But Brad was going to get them their first win had this accident not happened, where you know Carl and I. I was per, I was plenty okay with it because we were. It was Mark Martin, right, uh, and it was at Vegas, <laughs> right. And, you know, it was all the great things, and you knew that of all his Xfinity but wins, Brad was going to be most important fine. Part. You know what? Brad was learning a very valuable lesson. That was really a good lesson. Hey, he, yeah, here's a lesson. <laughs> this won't be your last run in with Carl. <laughs> yeah. But to finish off, how Rick got me to do the the other two years full time instead of part time was we went to Phoenix right away, whatever that's early in the season, about five races in. And we sat on the pole and won the race and we were really feeling good. And just a few weeks later we go to Darlington and win that race. And I'm like, Hey Rick, uh, I'd like to sit down and meet with you. And we sit down and, and I said, you know, you said you want me here as long as I'll drive and I'm willing to do those other two years, you know, uh, 
I'm willing. Yeah. Dude, we won. We won two races. Ain't even half season yet. All I wanted to do is win one. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, I was living a dream at that point. I would come home from the shop. Every time I'd go to the shop, I'd come home and Arlene would say, geez, you're smiling so big. And I said, it's just like going to NASA. I mean, you won't believe it. I'd never been to a place, an organization like Hendrick Motorsports in 09. It was just like a dream for me. And I could go in and say, you know, I'm having this little hot spot on my, on my leg and like Roush's, I would have to engineer the fix for it. I'd have mm. to come up with the fix and get the fix done myself. Dude, you could go in there and tell them I'm having this little issue. Their engineers had figured out and come with the fix for it and fix it for you. I mean, they did every, I mean, it was like heaven. And yeah. I know you, your experience was, was the same way there, Junior. It was, it was like heaven. And I was 50 years old, but dude, I was winning. I'd done one, two races. So it was, I was good with, with signing up and I, I, I stayed too long. I shouldn't have, I should have, you know, I should have probably just stayed in 09, 10. We ran pretty good, but not real good. And then, you know, my performance uh, just really seemed to drop off after that. Well, man, it was a awesome opportunity for me to be able to be in the same build with you and and keep learning. I mean, it would like my career had come full circle in a sense to be able to learn from you so much in the Xfinity Series in ninety eight, ninety nine. I mean, we were going to me and Matt and all those guys were going to school every week that we got to race with you, and then to be able to be in the same shop with you and even see more about what makes you tick was a blast for me. You'd been awesome to me my whole life, been so supportive of me uh, through my whole career, and so. Uh, that was a real pleasure for me to be in the shop with you, sharing the shop. It was good times, and you're such a re respectable guy. Uh, you, you've done so much for the sport on the racetrack and off the racetrack. Your respect for the history of, of NASCAR racing and racing itself is incredible, and we need that so much. And you're the guy that carries that banner for us and, you know, keeping the history alive of, of, of our our racing and NASCAR sports. So thank you.